Hey, welcome to Miles Square Church. My name is Matt Lidikanen. I'm the pastor here, and my wife, Nissa is our worship director, and you'll hear her voice as we sing our praises to God this morning. Just a really warm welcome to you. If you are newer here at Miles Square Church and you've been checking us out online, just want to say, hey, and I'm glad you're here. If you want to uh, do us the favor and fill out our online connection card, that would be a great help to us. That's just a way that we can connect with you and just continue to share the word of God and the hope of Jesus with you. So I hope that you'll take the opportunity to do that this morning. There's a button in the chat that you can do that. Or if you're uh, watching on Facebook, I'll share a link. Uh, it would be really great if everyone could come to our online campus and, and view that right now. We're at live.milesquare.church. And that's just kind of our place, our designated viewing platform that we want everyone to be at. So I hope that you're there with us this morning. We can chat and have prayer together. So please take advantage. Um, we're continuing our series this morning called Perhaps Today, where we've just, we started just last week where we talked about uh, the second coming of Jesus, what that means, what we should be expecting, and how we can interpret the world and the things that are happening around us. And today we're talking about death and what the Christian hope beyond death actually is. And it's a really grounding hope that we can hang on to in a time like this. And I hope that it really encourages your heart. Uh, and as a church, we continue to live out our mission to be a compelling connection to Christ and the Christian community. We really want to foster conversation. We want to be a church where you can uh, express deferring viewpoints where people from different walks of life can come together in one church and really walk together. Uh, that's, that's part of what it means to be the Christian church. And so we encourage you to text in questions. We encourage you to text in any of your prayer requests. We really do throughout the morning. There's a little thing on the bottom of the screen that'll say, uh, text in your questions to this number, 201-754-5271. Or you can also message your questions to our Facebook page, and I'll share a button intermittently throughout the worship this morning. And I encourage you to really take advantage of that because we really want to have this conversation with you and answer those questions. Um, with that, I just would like to pray together and then we will get into our worship this morning. God, thank you that you are God, that you are coming again, that Jesus, you are King of Kings and Lord of Lords. There is no one like you. We want to worship your name this morning. I pray for the person that's hearing my voice right now, that they would be strengthened and encouraged by our worship today, that they uh, can bring their troubles, bring their sins, bring their burdens to the foot of the cross this morning, and that they can receive help and mercy in their hour of need. I pray for them, I pray for our worship, and I pray that it would be a blessing in your name. And uh, we ask your presence in our homes, in our living rooms, wherever we might be, in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's sing together. what you say though the storms may come and the winds may blow i'll remain steadfast and let my heart learn when you speak a word it will come to pass great is your faithfulness to me great is your faithfulness to the setting same I will praise your name great is your faithfulness to me God from age to age though the earth may pass away your word remains the same Your history can prove That there's nothing you can't do You're faithful and true Though 
Though the storms may come and the winds may blow, I'll remain steadfast. And let my heart learn when you speak a word, it will come to been 
formed against me shall remain. I will rejoice, I will declare, God is my victory and He is here. This is my prayer when triumph is still on its way I am a conqueror and co-heir with Christ So firm on His promise I'll stand I will bring praise, I will bring praise No weapon formed against me shall remain I will rejoice, I will declare God, we thank you all of our life, in every season, you are still God. You're still our Father. You're still kind to us. You're still in our corner. Even when we're in the valley, even when we feel like we're, our life is in the pit, God, you're still here. You're still present. You're the God who is with us. You are Emmanuel, God with us. And we thank you, God, for that truth. And I believe that as a speaking uh, right now to somebody who really needs to hear it, you're still in the midst of uh, the muck and the mire with us. So thank you that you love us so much that you would actually become one of us. You became Jesus, who, was, who came in the likeness of a servant um, to bear our sins and to be our Savior. Lord, we thank you. We bless you. Uh, and I pray that you would continue to minister to us as we worship you today, as we see, receive your gifts in your word. And when we receive hope, a hope for a new tomorrow, a hope for a better future that you give to us in the confession that we have. We ask these things in the name of Jesus. Amen. Um, so as I, as I alluded to there, we have a really powerful grounding confession as Christians. We believe that the Bible teaches that this is not all that there is. There's a lot of confessions out there, a lot of different faiths, if you will, whether they be secular or religious, that don't have a lot of hope for the hereafter. Uh, 
for an atheistic perspective is that we just die and this is all that there is. There's really nothing much beyond this. This is, we have to make the most of this life. Uh, but the Christian vision is far more hopeful, far more filled with life. And we believe that there will be a resurrection, a life of the world to come. And we will be united with our bodies again and we will be renewed and reinvigorated. Jesus is going to make all sad things come untrue. It is a really cool thing. And we look at that in the, in the third article of the Apostles' Creed. And we're going to read that together in Martin Luther's, Luther's explanation. Uh, we, have that, we have a really great hope. So let's read that together. And uh, I invite you to read along with me, either aloud or in your heart. So let's look at that right now. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Christian Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. What does this mean? If you'd like to read along, now's your turn. I believe that I cannot, by my own reason or strength, believe in Jesus Christ my Lord or come to him. But the Holy Spirit has called me by the gospel, enlightened me with his gifts, sanctified and kept me in the true faith. In the same way he calls, gathers, enlightens, and sanctifies the whole Christian church on earth and keeps it with Jesus Christ in the one true faith. In this Christian church he daily and richly forgives all my sins and the sins of all believers. On the last day he will raise me and all the dead and give eternal life to me and all believers in Christ. This is most certainly true. And we see in this powerful confession, this explanation that the Holy Spirit who currently indwells every single Christian, the third person of the Trinity, is going to actually raise us from the dead. Just as he raised Jesus from the dead, we also will be raised and we will be with him forever. And that is a great promise to hold on to, particularly in a time like this. And so now I just encourage you, um, say hello to those who are in a chat. Let us know you're here and it'd be great to share that digital passing of the peace. Good morning, boys and girls, and good morning, Cleo. Good morning, Pastor Matt. Good morning, boys and girls. How are you guys? I'm sure they're doing pretty well. Hey, Pastor Matt, guess what? Uh, what's up? What happened? Well, I was running, and then I fell, and I actually hurt my knee the other day. Oh, wow, that hurts. Uh, what happened? Well, I was running, 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 and then I saw a friend that I knew. I said, hello, friend, and then I fell and I skinned my knee because I saw a bump in the road, or I didn't see the bump in the road, and then I fell and hurt my knee. You want to see? Uh, sure. Yeah, let's take a look. See, there it is. Got a Band-Aid and everything. Ouch. That kind of hurts. Yeah, it really did hurt a lot. And I fell on my hands and I kind of scraped them up too. Let's see. Mmm, yep. Yeah, it doesn't look too good. Yeah, but I'll be okay. Yeah, we all get hurt sometimes. It reminds me one time when I was little, I was playing Little League Baseball and uh, the coach hit a baseball to me and it was a pop fly and it was coming down from the sky and I had my glove there in the air and I was going to catch the baseball but then uh, the sun got in my eyes, oh, oh no, and then it fell and hit me in the mouth. Ow, that hurts a lot. Yeah, it, it really did hurt quite a bit, but I lost two teeth. Oh, so two birds in with one stone, or I guess a baseball in that case. Right, so I get to get a little bit of tooth fairy money. That was fun. Yeah, that's nice. But you know, it, it, all this reminds me, our bodies are really sensitive. They sure are. I get scraped up all the time. And our hearts can be really sensitive too. Yeah, you're right. Mean words do hurt, and sometimes they hurt even worse than falling down and skinning your knee. It, they sometimes do hurt worse than that. Uh, but the Bible says that one day all that's going to change. Oh, really? Yeah, so one day, it says that we're going to be changed in the twinkling of an eye at the blast of a heavenly trumpet when Jesus comes again. Um, he's going to say, he's going to basically make it so our bodies don't hurt anymore. And he's going to raise from the dead everybody who's gone to sleep, which means they've gone to be with Jesus. Wow, so when Jesus gets to, comes back and we get new bodies, we also get to see new friends and family that we've missed. 
and have gone to heaven? That's exactly right. Isn't that awesome? Yeah, it sure is. Wow. That's really cool. I can't wait to hug my grandma again. I'm, I really miss her a lot. Yeah, me too, Clea. I can really empathize with that. When Jesus comes back, he's going to make all the sad things come untrue. He's going to make a brand new world. He's going to make a brand new us. It's a really, really powerful hope we get to hold on to when we're sad. That sounds really amazing. Can we pray for that? Absolutely. I think we should pray for that. The Bible says we should. So why don't we? Let's do it. All right. Dear Jesus, dear Jesus, sometimes we hurt and feel sad. Sometimes we hurt and feel sad. But you can make all sad things come untrue. But you can make all sad things come untrue. Please come back soon. Please come back soon. In Jesus' name, amen. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, amen. I hope that Jesus does come back soon. Do you know when, Pastor Matt? I wish I did, but no one really knows the day or the hour he comes back. Well, I guess we'll have to just wait on and hope for the best. Let's just do it and keep praying for it. Okay, well, have a good day, boys and girls. God bless you. And remember, God loves you. Now we're going to take some time to look at our scripture lesson this morning. This scripture comes from 1 Corinthians chapter 15, where Paul talks at length about the resurrection of the dead and what that really looks like. And I think it's one of the most powerful and compelling chapters in all of scripture. I encourage you to check out the entire chapter. We're going to read a small chunk of that today. So let's listen and hear God's word read to us today. Corinthians 15, 50 to 58. I tell you this, brothers, flesh and blood cannot inherit the kingdom of God, nor does the perishable inherit the imperishable. Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound and the dead will be raised imperishable and we shall be changed. For this perishable body must put on the imperishable and this mortal body must put on immortality. When the perishable puts on the imperishable, and the mortal puts on immortality, then shall come to pass the saying that is written, Death is swallowed up in victory. O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? The sting of death is sin, and the power of sin is the law. But thanks be to God, who gives us victory through our Lord Jesus Christ. Therefore, my beloved brothers, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that in the Lord your labor is not in vain. Please join me in a word of prayer before we get into our message today. Dear Jesus, I thank you that you have called us by your name, that we are your children, and that you uh, have something to say today uh, in the midst of this trying season in our culture, in our nation. You are speaking even through the midst of this storm, so I pray that you would open our ears to hear what you have to say. And so may the meditations of our hearts and the words of my lips be pleasing in your sight, O oh Lord, our rock and our redeemer. Amen. So last week, we began our series called Perhaps Today, where we are going to be looking at the Christian beliefs surrounding the capital E, end. Last week, we looked at the end of the world and what Jesus teaches about that. There is, there, in the Gospels, Jesus actually teaches very clearly about what to expect, what to be looking for as signs of the end of the world. And we saw that there were three different responses we could have to that. One, we could be ambivalent, not really pay attention, not really care, or to kind of explain it away as like a natural phenomenon, which many, much of the world does. Uh, we could also overemphasize and really focus in and make everything about the end of the world, which some Christians have done, some churches have done. Um, or the third way, and what I advocated for, is that we can just be like his mother Mary, Jesus' mother. And she, what, what happened when she gave birth to Jesus, so many tremendous things happened to her, but she just kind of took it all and meditated on it, and it says that she treasured these things up in her heart and, uh, and just reflected on them. So just kind of look at these as signposts, right? To, to see these as markers that are telling us, hey, we're getting there, we're getting closer, Jesus is coming back soon. And that's what all of this turmoil, all this craziness in our world is all about, is a signpost pointing closer to Jesus' return. And so today we're looking at another Christian belief 
that pertains to the end of all things, and that is the end of human life, death itself. So in the New Testament, the human body is compared to a tent. And I've mentioned before how much I really enjoy camping. And I know that's not where everybody is right now, but just bear with me for a moment because I think those of you who don't like camping will appreciate what I'm going to share with you. Because um, it's really fun to go camping until it's not. So no matter how hard you try, for some reason at the end of your trip, your entire tent, it seems like it's filled with the Sahara Desert, like it's just like sand is up in your sleeping bag, it's all over the bottom of the tent, like how did it all get there? But I think that the worst thing about camping is when you have to get up at, to go to the bathroom in the middle of the night and you, you fight, you, know, like you wake up at like two in the morning and you like fight the urge, like I don't, ah, go back to sleep, go back to sleep, and you can't do it. And so you finally like, oh, I gotta get, you unzip your sleeping bag and you're, you're trying to tip through like across your tent mates, you're stumbling along hunched over and it's just like really uncomfortable. And then you try and like find all 10 zippers to get out of the door of the tent. You're like, get me out of here, I go to the bathroom. And then finally you get out, you're just in your jammies and you have to find the bathroom, remember where in fact the bathroom is. And it's just like an ordeal to get out there. Or if you're, if you're a man, uh, you can just go find a tree that's far away, right? <laughs> you don't have to worry about the bathroom necessarily. Um, but the best is when it rains, right? When, Whenever you go camping, no one is thinking, let's plan for a rain day. We need to have some rain day activities. Like everything about camping is anticipating we're going to be outside. And so then the entire time when it's raining, you have to do a lot of damage control and you have to mitigate how soaked everything gets. And truth be told, when the whole camping experience is over, everyone is happy to pack up the tent and go into a temperature controlled car as they drive home thinking of their temperature controlled house and they get to go uh, and take, uh, watch, watch a sh uh, take a shower, watch the TV, uh, use a real porcelain toilet that is clean, and you can go into your bed, and you will never take any of that for granted ever again, right? Like, <laughs> you get to the point where you're glad to go home. You're glad you have a house. So like camping in a tent, being a human being in this world can be a lot of fun. There's a lot of great things about being human in this world. But sometimes it can really bite. Regarding this, Paul writes, For while we are still in this tent, our bodies, we groan being burdened. And I think we all know exactly what he's talking about. So what about being human in our world most causes you to groan and be burdened? Is it A, aging, B, disease, C, sin, D, emotional wounds, E, spiritual wounds, all of the above, something else. There's a lot that we could list here, but take, some, take a couple seconds and just share your response in the chat. See, we deal with a problem as human beings, as the world, and it's called the second law of thermodynamics, the law of entropy. Things are constantly eroding and constantly breaking down, returning to a state of equilibrium. That's what the law of entropy is about. And for us, there is no grace period when we're not experiencing this. This is a constant process, and this is what causes us to age, and it causes us to ache, and it causes us to get sick. Things just kind of break down in our world and in our bodies and entropy is this clock that is always running out of time and eventually results in death. And death is awful. It's an inescapable monster that devours every single one of us. And sometimes it catches us early when we least expect it and it's those kinds of deaths that are just absolutely tragic. But other times it stalks us our whole life long. We think we're on top of it. We think we are going to escape it, but we're not. It will eventually catch up to us and eventually we'll be done into it. So let's just call the thing what it is. It, it's a beast. It's a monster. It's, a, it's something that steals life from the people that we love and refuses to give them back to us. 
it is a permanent experience. And scientifically, it might be the natural erosion of our bodies and our cells and just what happens to all organic matter and life on Earth, but spiritually and emotionally, it's the worst thing that can happen. Death is usually comfortably distant. It's out of sight, out of mind. We don't think about it. We're not thinking every single day, I'm going to die. You know, we don't think about that. We don't think like that. But then it rudely barges into our world and we have to think about the temporality of our lives. I haven't done many funerals as a pastor, but I remember the first one that I did. I was helping a pastor lead this particular funeral and the atmosphere in the room, of course, was really heavy. The family was quiet. And when we sang hymns, the worship felt really fragile and timid. And it was obvious why. I mean, the, it was an open casket funeral and their, uh, their loved one is sitting there in a casket in front of them, flanked by flowers. There's a portrait of her printed on the right hand side of the casket. And for the people in the room, I mean, they're all thinking, that's my wife. That's my mom. That's my aunt my mentor, my friend, and all of these things, all the trappings of the room reinforce what has transpired. It's reinforcing the awful truth that is finally setting in for them. And after the service, we processed out to the graveyard and she was going to be interned in one of the vaults in the mausoleum. And so we said some more prayers. We had a liturgy, read some scripture, and within the cold, Marble Hall, the mausoleum. And then we moved outside once again, and we looked up, and the vault was open, and it was ready. And they took a lift and lifted up the coffin and put that lift carefully by workers into the vault. And we all watched silently, but I think no one watched more carefully or more silently than her husband. And then when it finally was all done, she was put away he gave a small wave and then turned away and walked back down to the funeral home and we all followed and that was that moment, I think, above all the others that seemed to finally settle it for everybody. She, she was dead. As Christians, we have the hope that death is not the end. And we'll get to that, we'll unpack that. But I want you to think about a funeral that you've been to. In a word, what was the predominant feeling that was going through your heart? The predominant feeling that you felt like the room was feeling? Take some time to reflect on that and then share your response in the chat. So it's those feelings, those feelings that you, you've shared in the chat, the, the feelings that uh, those people at that funeral felt, that's the feeling of finality. And that's exactly what the disciples felt when Jesus died. See, what they saw in Jesus was irreversible, that no one was going to come back from a death like that. It was not going to be undone. He'd been bloodied, bloodied and bruised and mutilated. And if ever a death felt permanent, it was this one. That's why they put him in a tomb. They weren't thinking he's going to resuscitate. Like, there's not a chance of that. They recognized a dead body when they saw one. It was done. And their messianic hopes were completely dashed. They thought he's going to be the one that's going to deliver Israel. He's going to deliver us from the Romans. Do all these great things. And it's not that. There was nothing else to do but to wave goodbye and move on. But they couldn't. They couldn't leave and turn around completely and start thinking about things because... They didn't have time to prepare his body for burial because he was murdered before the Sabbath day and they couldn't do anything on the Sabbath day. They had to let it, let it lie. And so early the third day after this happens, the women in the company, they, they get up and they're going to the tomb. 
they have their spices, they have their perfume, and in their grief and in their turmoil of heart and soul, they forgot that they needed to have somebody along with them who could move the stone away from the mouth of the tomb because they couldn't get in there. I mean, just think about what's going through their minds right now, too. I mean, they're thinking, imagine if you had to go and have a funeral, and then you, like a couple days later, you had to go and dig, dig that coffin back up and prepare their body. Like, imagine if that was you. And this is what the women were having to deal with, Mary Magdalene and the rest. And so as they get closer, they realize they need to get, hey, they don't know how, how to move this stone out of the way. And they walk, and they're wondering what they're going to do, and they come around the bend. And then they look up, and they see the stone's gone. And it's like it's been cast aside like a pebble. And so they run to the entrance of the tomb, and they look in. And, at the, and the one person they thought was going to be there was gone. It was empty. And add to that dizzying shock of it all, there's suddenly two men appear in dazzling white clothes, and they tell them that Jesus is not here. He's been raised. And suddenly the words of the angels click into place for these women, and running out of the tomb, half for terror, half filled with joy, they go back and tell a somber mourning group of disciples that Jesus has been raised from death. Jesus is risen. And this resurrection isn't going to remain an isolated incident. The Bible says Jesus is the first fruit of the resurrection, and that because he's the first, he's not the last. And because he's not the first, because he's the first and not the last, all of us are going to experience this. Christians believe Jesus is going to defeat death. And we believe that he will be, will be raised imperishable at his coming. It says in Scripture, Behold, I tell you a mystery. We shall not all sleep, but we shall all be changed in a moment, in the twinkling of an eye, at the last trumpet. For the trumpet will sound, and the dead will be raised imperishable, and we shall be changed. This is your reality. This is your hope. This is what you are looking forward to, the monster of death that has so often swallowed our loved ones whole and seeks to swallow you, will be destroyed by the power of Christ in his resurrection. And what this promise says is that in an, in an indivisible moment of time, with a heavenly trumpet blast, we and everyone that we have loved will, who have died in Christ will be raised. And it says that we will be raised imperishable, never to decay, never to age, never to succumb to sickness. In the face of this hope, COVID-19 is a joke, you guys. The law of entropy will be broken. The law of life will reign. That's what we're looking forward to. And not only will they be raised imperishable, will we be raised imperishable, but we ourselves will be changed in the blink of an eye if we are so lucky as to be here when Jesus Christ does in fact return. It says, for this perishable body must put on the imperishable, and this mortal body must put on immortality. This temporary tent, this camping tent that we call our body will be completely and utterly transformed. Our tent will become a house. It'll be more. It'll be bigger, better, faster, stronger. It will be permanent. Just as a caterpillar changes into a butterfly, as an acorn changes into an oak tree, we are going to put on immortality. So, I want to ask you, what about this promise most excites you? Go ahead and take some time to think about that and share your response in the chat when you have something. It's an exciting promise, isn't it? It's, it's incredible. And I dare you, imagine a world like this. Just kind of let your mind wander because this is such a beautiful hope that Christianity offers. And it offers this hope of a, of a physically redeemed bodily world. It's a world that you can touch with your hands and poke with your fingers and glimpse and see with your eyes. And from the mundane to the extraordinary, the world is going to experience the multiplication and abundance of life not death. Just think about every single thing we consider normal today. 
walking around in masks and social distancing for fear of the virus and its deadly consequences. Uh, many of us need glasses. I need glasses. My eyes are terrible, right? We, we, we don't have great vision. Many of us have allergies that either are, nu are a nuisance or they could be life-threatening, depending if it's shellfish or something like that. You have to be really careful. Some people develop degenerative brain diseases like Alzheimer's. Some of us have been diagnosed with cancer, which is like a form of death itself. Uh, millions of people have intellectual disabilities. All of this we consider normal. All of this we, we just say this is what we deal with. No one is surprised when we hear about any of this. But what would be surprising is the person who's never caught a cold, has 20-20 vision, has a brilliant mind, who breathes freely during allergy season, someone who's completely at peace. Sin doesn't touch this person. They don't look a day over 25. That would be remarkable. But however remarkable that would be, it's impossible, right? Not in the era of resurrection. In the age to come, what we consider impossible today what couldn't even cross our minds as a remote possibility today will be as normal as rush hour traffic on 495. This kind of world is almost impossible to fathom, but it's coming. It's real. It's concrete. It's physical in that we will one day all experience together. And it starts with the return of Jesus and his complete and utter destination of death. And in the words of scripture, O death, where is your sting? O grave, where is your victory? That is the hope we have. That's what's coming at the end of all things. So let me give you one minute to just process and, and hear what God has been saying to you throughout the course of this message. How is God giving you hope with this message, with this truth, with this promise in the midst of this season? Take a couple of minutes, take a minute to reflect on that. Please join me in a word of prayer. Dear Lord God, we thank you that you have redeemed us and rescued us uh, from death. For you now, death is but a word, and we will all awaken. Um, whether we will be redeemed here, or our bodies will be changed in the twinkling of an eye, or we will be raised imperishable from, from death. God, we know that when you come, you're going to come with life and life abundant. And so, Lord, we ask that you would strengthen our hearts with that truth, with that promise today. Death, where is your victory? Death, where is your sting? God, we love you. Thank you so much for this gift and this promise. In Jesus' name, amen. Let's sing together. Just one life laid down for
As we continue our worship today, I just want to share a couple things with you. First of all, uh, I just want to invite you, if this is a, a message, this is a, a, a word of hope that you have been missing in your life and that the gospel of Jesus is really bringing your heart alive today and you don't know what it really means to follow Jesus, but you'd like to, um, I'm going to share a button in the chat right now that would allow you to uh, just share a little bit about your story, what makes you want to follow Jesus today. And I'd love to reach out to you and have that conversation about what it looks like to um, be a Christian and just have that, just know that that opportunity is there for you. And I encourage you to check it out. Um, as we continue worship as well, we're going to be taking our tithes and our offerings. And, and my encouragement, you know, the Lord, the scripture says that God loves a cheerful giver and that no gift should be under compulsion. And I recognize, man, we have a lot uh, of different different folks in, in our congregation. We've all been impacted by this crisis in various ways. Some of it's financial, and sometimes we just can't give like we wanted to give before. And I recognize that, and that's okay. And I just want to encourage you, if you are able in this season, and, and, and you're able to give uh, in a way that is, is generous and would bless the heart of the Lord and would be 
a, a gift to our church, I encourage you to think about a percentage of uh, your, your paycheck that you could be offering to us uh, today and to, to the ministry of the kingdom of God and the mission of Jesus in our city. So I encourage you to take some time to just reflect on that, prayerfully uh, consider what you might give as a cheerful giver today. Um, my announcement to share with you today is we're going to be beginning phase two of our reopening plan beginning August 2nd. What is phase two? Phase two is what we're calling the microchurch phase. What we've been doing for the past several months is just doing online only worship services. And so you've been in, in the comfort of your own home with your family by yourself watching this service at your leisure. What this is going to mean is that we're going to be starting to form small micro churches. And this could be just like two couples, could be a, just a handful of people gathering at a patio, but they're basically outdoor online in-person gatherings. So we're not having a large in-person gathering yet. Um, but we're going to be doing these smaller, intimate gatherings where there will be a, a, a different version of our worship service. We'll have uh, a welcome, a song, and a sermon, but the sermon's going to be more oriented toward conversation and discussion. So just picture you're having a conversation, you're worshiping with your friends, and you're having some breakfast at the same time, all on their backyard patio or whatever they might be. So we're going to have a bunch of people that are opening their homes, opening their rooftops, wherever they might go, going to a park and worshiping together um, in this way. And so my encouragement, this is, this, is what, this is where we're going, this is our direction, and I encourage you to come along with us. You can do this by yourself, but it's way more fun if we're doing it together. And I think we all desperately crave and desire community and relationship. And so my hope is you'll take advantage of this. We have a, a sign-up sheet that'll be live every single week. Um, and you can tap on that right now. You can fill that out right this minute, or you can fill it out at the end of the worship service. I'll share it again. Um, but please take the time to do that, um, and we'll move on to phase two really soon. But uh, with that being said, I have some other announcements that you can take a look at by watching this video. Morning Mile Square Church Online is easy, fast, and secure. I'll show you how it's done. First, open your web browser on your phone and type in supportmilesquare.church. It'll take you to the giving page of the Kairos Network. The Kairos Network is the network our church is funded by. Enter the amount you'd like to give and make sure the Kairos Hoboken Fund is selected from the drop-down menu. If you want to give to our COVID-19 fund, just select that one instead. 100% of the money donated there goes to different community initiatives within Hoboken. After that, just select if this is a one-time gift or a regular gift. It's your name, email, hit continue. If you're doing this for the first time and you're not in our system, you'll get an email with a link to your profile and you'll be able to finalize your gift after following the prompts. We're going to conclude our worship service today by praying together, and we're going to use our regular uh, prayer acronym SIT, which is Surrender, Intercession, and Thanksgiving. A nice time of reflective, meditative prayer, and just uh, I encourage you to just hear, listen to my voice as I lead you through these steps of prayer this morning. Surrender. As we begin to pray, let's check in with ourselves. We want to bring our true selves to our true God, and we know that there's brokenness. We know that there is sin. We know that there's things that are unpleasant. There are skeletons in our closet. And yet God encourages us 
to let those things be known, to not be afraid or ashamed of sharing that with him. Scripture says, if we say we have no sin, we deceive ourselves and the truth is not in us. We know that we have sin. We know that we've messed up. But it also says, but if we confess our sins, God, who is faithful and just, will forgive our sins and cleanse us from all unrighteousness. So let's confess our sins to God our Father right now in a moment of silence. There's this great psalm, Psalm 51, where David writes this powerful confession and he recognizes when he's when he keeps all of his sin inside, when he keeps it bottled up and he doesn't share it with the Lord, it's it's like death to him. It just feels poison in his body and his soul. But when he confesses his sin, he acknowledges, God, you know, cleanse me with hyssop and I'll be clean. Wash me and I'll be whiter than snow. And that's what David received, the psalmist. He, he receives the grace and the forgiveness of God. No matter how heinous his sin was, no matter what he'd done, God was still there to show grace to him, grace like a waterfall. And so I want to share with you that same grace. And it's when Jesus gave his Holy Spirit, he gave his people the authority to forgive sins. And so hear the words of forgiveness by the authority of the Holy Spirit. I forgive you of all of your sins in the name of the Father and of the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. Let's keep praying. Intercession. In the Gospels, it says that, that God is a good Father and He sends His rain on the just and on the unjust. And that's both the gift of rain, the water from heaven, and also the rain of the kingdom the reign of heaven. God, we thank you that your reign as king comes to all people and you show kindness and mercy and love even to those who do not deserve it. And yet do you desire to make this world more like heaven? We pray your kingdom come, your will be done in the Lord's prayer on earth as it is in heaven. So Lord, we look at those places on earth that could be more like heaven. We direct those prayers and intercessions for those things to you now. Thanksgiving. Your father is a good father and he sends so many gifts. We have been seated in the heavenly places at the right hand of God the Father Almighty with our Lord Jesus Christ. We're seated with him in the heavenly places and we've been given so many things. We have been given an imperishable inheritance that is kept for us undefiled in heaven. We are the children of Almighty God. That is enough. And yet God has given us all so many gifts. Jesus says, seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness and all these things will be added to you. And we have been given so many things. So many things have been added to us. So let's give thanks right now for those things that have brought joy to our hearts this week. Let's do that now in a time of prayer.
God, we thank you for hearing our prayers. We thank you that we can come to you in every need with anything on our hearts, just knowing that you're listening. Sometimes that's enough. But Lord, we thank you for listening to our prayers that we've lifted to you today. And we pray in the, in the name of Jesus and in the way that he taught us to pray. Our Father, who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Well, it has been a delight to worship with you this morning. I hope that what has been shared has been an encouragement to you and it's been lifting up your soul today. I hope that you continue to have an uplifted day today. And if you would like to join us for our coffee and conversation chat, um, you'll have to join us next week because we're actually gonna have the Lord's Supper this Sunday. So there will be a Zoom link shared here in the chat. If you'd like to join us for that, all you need is bread, uh, wine, or grape juice. Uh, if you're gluten intolerant, you can you can have a gluten-free variety of bread if that would fit the bill for you. But I'd love to continue to have a short service of the sacrament with you after we close today. If you you cannot participate, that is totally fine. Um, but I ask that I hope that you receive the blessing of the Lord, this ancient blessing, the Aaronic benediction. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make His face shine upon you. The Lord look upon you with His favor and give you His peace. Have a great day. See you soon.